Buenas tardes, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Igor Yovoy. I'm a Solidity developer, a CEO founder. And previously, I worked at Open Zeppelin and co founded a DeFi startup called Baby on Finance. Today, I'm excited to present you a workshop titled Unlimited Size Contracts. Before we jump into action, uh, you might want to download a GitHub repo for this workshop. Either use the QR code or just Google GitHub YOV-IO workshop and you'll get it. We also will need a foundry for this workshop. If you have it, great. If you don't have it, just install it using the link in the slide. And then run two commands, foundry up and forge build. Uh, I know internet is pretty bad here, and so for some reason you can't download it and install it. Uh, don't worry, uh, the repository will stay up and you have access to it, and I'll post the slides tomorrow, and I'll be doing some live demos so you can just watch and get the idea what's going on. Let's jump right into it. All right. Who has ever deployed here and written a smart contract? Please raise your hand. Yes, Solidity developers. Okay, who has ever run into the issue of a contract size limit here? Please raise your hand. Wow, it's way more problem than I thought. So yeah, this picture, uh, it illustrates my personal pain uh, while working baby on finance. We pretty quickly ran at the issue of a contract size limit. And it's not an easy issue to address, and it causes us a lot of pain. And one uh, fellow developer I know in the Solidity space called this limitation, uh, I quote, bane of my existence. So this is how big this problem is. And we are going to tackle it today. So there is a, a few solutions for this. Well, you can reduce byte code size using various techniques and essentially it's like alternative sport to guess golfing i called it byte code golfing i certainly do not recommend it because it's like a diminishing return sport with each optimization you have like less and less space left for each new function and it even may compromise the security of your project so i would be wary of using this technique and i suggest to try to uh, design your architecture from day zero in the way it supports uh, your contracts to be unlimited size. Other solutions are external libraries, static precompiled router, and a dynamic router. We will cover the, them in this workshop and hopefully have some time for questions and discussions. All right, we're gonna use a simple contract uh, as a baseline contract for this workshop. Uh, it's called a counter. It has a few functions. A set function, which sets a int variable to a new value. A get function, which retrieves this variable. And finally, a const function, which just returns a constant. These are good functions for a baseline contract because they essentially utilize one sload operation, one store operation, and returning the constant value. Uh, and these uh, examples are quite um, well, well spread in real smart contracts. All right, um, let's jump into the code. Uh, here we have um, our counter contract. Again, I'm not going to spend any time on this. It's pretty basic. What is important about it, it's rather small. So if you look at the bytecode size, you can see it's under one kilobyte, which is great, and we have a lot of space left. But let's say a product team says, oh, well, actually we need to implement this new call feature called quote, a function. And a quote function is a function which returns just like big string, which takes all the space. And then if you look at this big modular, it like takes almost all the space in the contract with few left. 
And if we try to implement it in very naive way using Solidity inheritance, so we just, okay, so the counter, the big modular, like done, job done. And then we discover that no, big counter is over the size of the limit. We can't deploy it, with nothing can be done, it can't be optimized. So how we can solve it? The first solution is external libraries. External libraries is a, is a, is a feature of a solidity. So uh, how it works is that in your contract, uh, in your methods, you just call uh, a library instead of implementing it in the contract. In this case, we have uh, two libraries. One is called storage lib, which contains our original counter methods such as set, get, const. And finally, we have a quote lib, which contains the only quote method, which contains this big string. And if you look at the implementation details, the catch here is that you need to pass this parameter, which is uh, canonically called self and has a storage type. And this, like a special syntax in Solidity, allows you to modify storage in external contract. And essentially, external libraries in Solidity is just abstraction layer over DLJ call. And that's basically it. There is not much to this. And if we go back to our presentation, uh, we can quickly uh, sum up all the ups and downs of this approach. So the good part about it, it comes with some security guarantees by Solidity. The main important one is the library can't call self-destruct. So you, you, library can't destroy your smart contract, which is important because it's not the case if you use diligent code directly, essentially proxies, where if a proxy contract calls self-destruct, your contract is done. It's somewhat easy to add one more leap. Um, you can always introduce one more leap. And it's um, gas efficient to a degree, but a bit later on this. And the main uh, down, downsides of this is that it's not truly infinite because to define to add one more function, you need like external wrapper function, which stack up quite quickly. And eventually you will run out of space in your surface contract. And it doesn't matter how many leaps you can write more, there will be just no more space. And the final downside, maybe for some projects, external libraries can be used, uh, can support upgradable contracts. So once you deploy your external libraries, it's like set in stone and you can't change it. Okay, the next approach is a static pre-compiled rotor. Um, this work was pioneered by Alejandro Santander from uh, Synthetics. He also previously worked at Open Zeppelin, and he is known at, as a Fernand on Twitter. And if you look at like, if you want to take a look at production ready, like stable code, I suggest you check out Hard Hat Rotor package at the Synthetics repo. Uh, and we, what we are going to take a look at a simplified example. So, so the idea um, for the static router is pretty simple. Uh, it's a smart contract which has no, fun no external functions and it only has a fallback and receive functions. And what it does, it calls a forward function inside both of them. And the forward function consists of two parts. Um, the, lookup part for the implementation address and the assembly part for the call. I'm not going to spend time on this. I'm just going to say this is like a canonical implementation of a proxy delegate call in assembly, which is used by all the proxies. And what it does, it basically sends your function call to whatever the implementation contract is and then returns its results. And the interesting part is here. So uh, in Solidity, each function has a signature. And as you can see here, we have a, a switch for a signature method. And based on the signature of a called function, we pick up an implementation address, which is later used for DDJ call. And as you can see here, we have a four functions registered for a counter modular, which is a get, set, const, and one function registered for a quote modular. Uh, because it's like so big and based on uh, function signature, we do pick up uh, a right implementation address and then use it for delegate call. And again, if you go to uh, our contract sizes, 
why it works because these are three separate contracts. We have a big modeler which is within the limits. Then we have a um, counter modeler which is also within the limits. And finally, uh, static rotor itself is pretty small because it just with one function. Though the more functions you have, the more its byte size grows because you have to add each function here as a new line. Though it grows way less than external libraries example. And if we go back to slides, we can see what are the benefits of using it. It's extremely gas efficient. Why? Because it's all pre-compiled in byte code, so you don't need to waste any expensive operations as it has load on the router itself. Your function code goes to the router and then immediately calls DLJ call. So your most guess overhead comes from DLJ call, which is about 2,600 guess. It's almost infinite. It will take really a lot of functions before you run out of space in this router in terms of adding with like constant signatures and contract sizes. It doesn't require external functions. Well, the downsides are um, pretty expected because it's essentially a proxy. You can't use a, a constructor. So you have to use initialize methods. And cross-modular calls can be tricky and you have to use uh, explicit storage slots so you don't, um, your different modules do not write to the same storage. And then finally, develop and, and maintain overhead can be tricky because you need to pre-compute all these signatures and addresses upfront and you don't want to do it by hand, which is, I recommend check out again, Hard Hard Router, they built a plugin which does that for you. Well, this like a second approach, how you can uh, achieve infinite size and compare it to libraries. It's like better in the way which gives you like more control using like assembly and low level language features. The next idea is iteration on a static rotor. It's not necessarily better. It is a different approach. It depends on your project. I call it dynamic rotor. Uh, if you're interested in product level battle tested implementation of this idea. I highly recommend you to check out EP2535 by Nick Much. Um, this AP is, covers far more things than just uh, unlimited contract size, but one thing it certainly does achieve is unlimited contract size through a dynamic router. Uh, I've written a simplified example of this uh, dynamic router, so let's get to it so we can see how it works. Um, it's quite similar to a static rotor in the same way it has a fallback receive functions, which just forward every function call to, um, to our forward function. But the difference comes in this line. If in a static rotor function, we have a switch case, which just goes, oh, hey, this, for this signature, I have this address. In the dynamic router, we are using a smart contract storage mapping, which is called modulus. And as you can, as you can see here, uh, we pick up an implementation address using a message signature. And then the rest of the implementation is functions the same. We just provide uh, this implementation to delegate call. And essentially, it works in the same way. The, essential difference between static router and dynamic is the static router has all the signatures and all the implementations and traces hard-coded in its byte code, where dynamic router use uh, mapping on the storage of a smart contract to uh, track them. And that adds pluses and minuses to this approach. So the pluses is once you deploy your dynamic router, you can add more modules even it's already deployed, or you can like fix bugs by updating it. Here I have this function update modulus, and it's also pretty uh, straightforward. As you can see, we just iterate and uh, add selectors to implementations. The downside of this approach is you have to manage access rights. You, you can't allow anyone to update uh, functions of your router. That would be disastrous, a critical issue in security terms. And there are different ways to use it. You can use um, open Zeppelin access roles or some like other techniques, but that's like out of the scope of this workshop. But you just have to keep this in mind. And 
we go back to presentation, um, dynamic router is the first router which is truly infinite because all the mappings between uh, function signatures and implementations are inside the storage, which is, as we all know, very big in solidity, then you can literally add infinite amount of functions to this router. So it's very good for a complex system which would require upgrades and have like long expected lifetime. Then another option, another plus I just mentioned, it can be updated any time. Well, I mean, it can be a minus if you're getting hacked, but generally it's a plus. Has no external functions. So the main downside of this is it's like gas expensive. This function is essentially here is uh, reading a storage, which is extra S load, which is uh, about 2000 gas and the set part, you have to pay it for every contract call. And then another downside is you have to manage access rights, who can update this router. If you want to build a truly unstoppable contract, maybe you don't want to have any upgrades. And there can be many solutions like governments and multi sig but you eventually have to figure it out for yourself. These are the three main approaches. Uh, which you can use to tackle uh, infinite size contracts. And then what's like important, what's the difference between infinite size contracts and normal contracts in this approach? It comes down to a gas overheads. Essentially, um, here in this table, we are comparing our base contract with, with three approaches in terms of gas. And why gas is important, uh, like a short story when was like a bull run and gas prices were high we were seeing the the function calls for the users in the price ranges of 100 dollars 200 dollars and even 300 dollars for some projects and a lot of these gas costs were coming from using proxies because proxies has a gas overhead at each function call and if you really have a complex DeFi system where protocols call each other and they all have they are all proxies this um, amount of overhead stacks pretty heavily even within your own protocol and it's like important to keep an eye on these gas overhead calls so let's dig down a bit in these numbers uh, the first base contract are the numbers for our base calls, so it's like no diligent code involved. And then if we look at that, the base call for a constant call, it just returns a number, it's like very small. And the first number in red is just what's the overhead and gas, and the second number in red is in percentage. And you can see for like a simple return call of a constant value, the overhead is actually around 2000 percent which is like insane and you may say oh it's not practical you know to return a constant value but you'll be far from the truth because the famous uc20 token has a, a member a function called decimals which returns how many decimals the token has and you have to call this function if you're a DeFi developer because in order to handle ec20 token you have to know uh, how many decimals this token have and one of the most common uh, UC20 tokens, like USDC, they are proxy contracts. So every time you call decimals, you overpaying roughly 2,000% or probably more. But anyway, let's take a high level look at this approach. So as you can see, indeed, static router is the most gas efficient approach. So if you have to build a gas efficient uh, infinite contract and you are and you know what kind of functions you're gonna have and don't plan to upgrade, then it's like a great solution. And then dynamic router is make more expensive, even more expensive than external library. Um, the reason I wouldn't recommend external library, as you can see, it has unusually high overhead for quote, more than double than it should. And I think it has something to do with uh, how Solidity pass with like big amounts of data, but I haven't dipped the byte gold yet. But just be wary if using external libraries and you pass or return a big amounts of data, then your gas expenses may surprise you. And 
to take a look at these, uh, what would be the high level uh, conclusions of this overview is that uh, your gas overhead obviously is more significant for uh, low fun for functions which are low in gas. So essentially, if your function has only a single S load, then you would pay a lot of gas. So what it means in practical terms, which I also encounter it, is that if you need to build a function which returns some like data around your protocol smart contract, you may want to bulk them, all these data in one function call, so you don't need to call five functions in a row because you would pay a guess overhead on each call. Essentially, uh, batching view functions might be a good idea. Then, again, the bigger the baseline uh, guess cost for your function, the less you care about it. So let's say you have a function which is uh, quite expensive, let's say 300K then suddenly 5k overhead doesn't look that bad. Um, though there is a catch to this. Um, in many protocols, not all functions are equal. Essentially, if you look at like typical vault functions, such as deposit or withdraw, which are mostly called by the user, so you won't achieve uh, the maximum gas efficiency on these functions. And some like admin functions, which are rarely called, you may want you know to skip uh, optimizing guess for them. And um, because the guess is so important, uh, I spent some time thinking and trying to figure out a trick how we can improve this. And I came up with a solution which we use successfully in production to reduce the gas cost of our contracts. We never found anyone using it um, somewhere on the internet or on GitHub, which is why um, I had to coin uh, the term for this approach. So I'm, coin, I'm calling it like loaded router. And so the approach is pretty simple because like if we go back to a static router, so the static router in our case, um, it doesn't take much space. And even if it grows, there's still a lot of space left. And what you can do essentially is again, using Solidity inheritance, you can, inherit some functions of your contract to a static router, uh, which allows them to be as gas efficient as the contract itself, because it's essentially a contract itself. So in the other ways, if there is some space in terms of byte code size left in your static router, you can put the functions there, which either people use the most in your system or the functions which uh, has the highest guess overhead, like calling decimals. And this allows you to save quite a bit of gas because, um, just to give a better explanation of this, uh, if you combine static router with a counter modular, we don't get to this forward function because static router now is counter modular. And that results in a quite significant gas savings. And the same approach can be applied to dynamic router. I'm just going to mm, show you the code, but it's like pretty uh, straightforward. You again can inherit counter model. But here this, this is the catch with a dynamic router. Because in dynamic router, we can update implementations of a function. If you place a function like get a set on the router itself, you will never be able to update it. So that is why it's like rather risky. And you should be very mindful which functions you put in dynamic router because you don't want to be in a situation where a critical bug was found in the function and you can't update it. And it's just like a terrible situation to be in. And with this approach, we can crunch some guess numbers. So now here we're using routers themselves as a baseline. And then they are loaded version essentially uh, as improvement. And as you would expect, because we move a constant function from sitting behind the delegate call back on the router, it results either to 95% improvement or 97% improvement for a constant function. It results around 54 or 68% improvement for a get function, which is a single S load. And a single S load function is not that uncommon as you might think because 
For example, EC20 balance of function is just a single S load. And again, this function is called a lot, and I don't really expect it to, ch to be changed. And then finally, for a single S store operation, uh, the savings amount is about 11 or 18 percent. So it's like not that much, but like still um, sizable. And what you could, you like looking at these numbers, my suggestion would be is to move um, log S function on the router if they use a lot. So this is the most best saving, or just the functions you expect. Uh, user face to be user facing. So the the functions people will use the most. Again, as a transfer function, a deposit, or withdraw, or claim revert. And then finally, the pure functions, which is just a constant, have the biggest impact on this. Uh, and just to give this some practical meaning, let's look take a look at the two most common uh, contracts: is essentially C20 token and RC721, which is an NFT. Uh, we can see surprisingly many functions of rec 20 function 20 token, such as name and symbol in decimals. In most implementations, they really return a constant. You know, just like name is like my great token, symbol is like three letters, and decimal is like 18 number, right? And in most projects, really, these functions will never change. And literally, if you write in ERC20 token, which has decimal functions, which will return different values. I might have a problem with you. Please let me know. <laughs> and um, even going back, even going later, so total supply, many RC20 tokens has a fixed total supply, right? So there is, again, no reason for this function to be upgradable or to be sitting behind the daily rate call. Um, and then things get tricky. So I can see how transfer allowance or proof can be um, changed in the future, maybe standards change, but it's like up to uh, every developer. You have to make call on yourself whenever your project uh, will encounter these issues in the future or not. And um, the same logic more or less applies to EC721. Um, but these are just two common contracts. I really wanted to show on them kind of logic I would follow if I would build a complex system where I would just sit down and look at my contracts and look at which methods are uh, not going to change for sure uh, and which are like, safe to put on the router itself to save the gas uh, and which uh, makes the most sense. Because, for example, at Babylon Finance, we had this like, admin model which had like a lot of admin functions. But it's pretty much only us or governance we're calling them. So we really didn't care about the gas, gas cost of this. So I was like confident just like putting them behind the digit call and being upgradable. And let's, let's uh, jump back to the code. So here you would see once we put uh, these functions on our routers, they do grow in size. So a loaded static router is uh, slightly bigger than uh, just a static router. Uh, that's because we merged all these functions on this contract. And eventually, you hit the size of how many functions you can put uh, on your router, which we did. And that is why you also should be like mindful that you have to put the functions on the router, which like your absolute top priority in terms of gas. So if it's like questionable, don't do it. And the same applies to dynamic router, so it's higher. But to repeat, uh, secu my security concern, concern once again, um, dynamic router is different from static router in the sense that if you put a function on the router itself, then it can be upgraded later, and you should be like, super careful doing this. The code, uh, the repo, uh, is already public and it has all these examples as well as the test, which uh, just made, sh which actually makes sure that all we discussed is worked. So here you can see that creating static router is simple because it has everything encoded in it. While to create a dynamic router, we need to 
build all these modules. So we need to dynamically fetch all the selectors for the methods. And then we create a model definition, which is uh, an array of selectors uh, binded to a certain implementation. And finally, uh, we can use with modulus to initialize our dynamic router with update modulus. And this is the same way you can uh, update existing functions or add new even after the deployment. And here we have tests uh, to make sure that all these uh, functions work. And if you will be checking out this repo later, you can uh, run the following command, uh, test guest report to see all the guest numbers we just looked. And speaking of these guest numbers, um, these numbers are produced on a 0 0.a Solidity compiler with optimization set on and about 200 optimizations run on. Uh, let's get back to our presentation. And uh, that will be it. Thank you for your time. I hope you find it useful. I hope you built unlimited contracts successfully and never experienced the pain I did. Please follow my Twitter. I do post development stuff there.